Today we are going to speak about why you should not give money to monks and what you can do instead of giving money to monks. This is uh, both for uh, monks who normally use money and this is uh, especially important for monks who uh, do not use money. So it's a very, it's a very important uh, lesson today. I hope you can watch and listen carefully to the complete video. And so now uh, we will start. Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase So, if you don't know this already, I will tell you now, you should never Never, ever give money to monks. However, there are other ways to make useful donations to monks who use money and monks who do not use money. Uh, when I say useful, I mean allowable donations. Money is not allowable. so. Whether the monk uses money or whether the monk does not use money, you always want to give an allowable gift. It is very important to always make allowable gifts. Why? Because when you give something unallowable, such as money, it is not allowable for all monks. So if you give enough money, let's say, for a monk to buy his own telephone, like he, he takes the cash that he saves up and he, he's handling this money and he goes to the telephone shop, he buys, I don't know, iPhone, iPad, whatever. This iPhone, iPad, whatever, is not allowable for, not only for himself, but also for all other monks. This iPad or iPhone or whatever will not be allowable for any monk to use. If that other monk uses something that another monk bought himself, then this monk is also breaking the Vinaya, the monk's rules. So it's not good for this particular monk and also other monks. We have rules where when you give something to a monk, it affects the other sangha, uh, the, the rest of the sangha. For instance, food. My sister, she doesn't know much about, about the food and offering. She only knows about giving food when I'm around. And usually I'm the only person or, or I bring another monastic friend with me. And she's usually offering hand to hand. To, to both of us. And she saw some uh, video or something uh, where the monks were taking the food uh, from the, uh, we could say the buffet table or something like that, the, the general, f the, t the table where all the food for Sangha is laid out. And the monks just take without it being offered individually. And so I had to explain to her that when you offer it to one monk, it becomes allowable for all of the monks and doesn't have to be offered again. Because the food will be used, it's good until the high noon. And if that monk does things in an unallowable way with this food, for instance, let's suppose he, he moves, he touches and moves the table, thinking, uh, I want this table and I want this food. This is my food. And he moves the table, he touches the table, he moves the table. Then all of this food has to be relinquished. It's not allowable for the rest of the monks. And the monks will not get any food if they, if they really care about the rules. So there are rules that when some, a monk, an individual monk, does something 
unallowable, it affects all other monks. So this can be a big problem because if the monk buys a monastery with his money or he makes repairs onto the monastery with his money, then this whole monastery or the building, at least definitely the building, if it's the land, the whole land gets, is unallowable, then these become unallowable. It's a shame because everyone wants to make merit. Everyone wants to do something worthwhile. Even the monk who's buying all this stuff or making the repairs to the monastery. But he's so used to breaking the rules regarding money that it doesn't seem to affect him. So the monastery, if the monk is doing all, this, all these good things and he's making the monastery, he's making repairs to the monastery, he's wanting to do good things and he's using his own money to do that then what happens is the whole place becomes unallowable. And then this is a problem for the other monks. And it's very difficult, very, very, very difficult, very rare, very rare case where, uh, where the monks can, can use this monastery. A lot of times we, we I know of one monastery that uh, there was there was an unallowable place there. And what they did was they, they took that building and they dedicated it as maybe like a place where lay people could sleep or something like that, but not the, monas the monks of the monastery. Uh, so I remember, this is a long time ago, I remember this place. Never been to that monastery, but uh, the rest of it, the monastery is allowable. And so it can be very, very complex, you know. A lot of the monasteries nowadays, they're owned by the nonprofit organization. So it's a little difficult how to, how to understand uh, how, that, how these monasteries are. But in Asia, uh, they can never be made allowable again. They either have to be dedicated as uh, something for lay people or they... Um, or they just don't use it, or they abandon it, or they uh, decide to uh, go to a fresh new place. So it's a shame because, you know, you have, you have monasteries and uh, these places uh, can never be used by monks who, who care about the rules regarding money and make a strong effort to follow those rules. And so it's a... Um, some people ignore the rules and they think, okay, we have to do what we can. Uh, so it's, it's a problem. There's another reason why we don't go to these uh, monasteries that uh, use money. A lot of times during uh, big uh, celebrations or something when the lay people come, they start handing out the money to all the monks. I've been to... <laughs> I've been to one of these places. I went to a funeral, and they were giving, they were giving money, and, uh, and I, I have to refuse it. You have to refuse by verbal or by physical gesture. You should, you should refuse in that way, and I did. I just I stuck my hand out. I went like this, and they gave me a, you know, another look, and uh, I said, yeah, I don't want it, and then they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't do it, or someone just left it on the table, and I... And, uh, and I uh, another person, another monk, he asked me if, he, if I wanted that $20, and I said, I, he asked if he can took it, I said, if he could take it, and I said, uh, I said, it's, it's not mine, it's not my money, and uh, he, he took it, he was probably happy. And sometimes they get angry, though, sometimes they get angry because um, afterwards, actually, people were talking, they said, did you see that American monk, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't take that money. There was an envelope, which probably had a lot more money in there and uh, I refused the envelope. So other times, uh, some monks can be appreciative of our practice. They understand that we're sincere, doing it as an act, um, we want to follow the rules, we're very serious about the rules, and they can uh, appreciate that. And sometimes they, they tell the, the donors, you know, that we have a special practice uh, where we don't use money. And uh, a lot of times, the monks can be um, uh, uh, very uh, compassionate and, and try to help us uh, keep our rules. I remember there was one monk and he was very nice about uh, me not using uh, the money and he would tell the, tell the donors who, who had money that, uh, that I didn't accept the money. 
and uh, and so they were very nice about it. Some some people have been uh, more nice about it, and other monks I've heard um, can get angry. But so far, so far I think the the monks have been quite nice to me about that. But normally we we try to avoid situations like that because it it makes uh, some people feel uncomfortable, and we don't want to shock the donors and. Um, and also uh, create bad feelings towards the other monks. And my purpose is not to stop donations from going to other monks. And I'm going to explain what you should do with monks who normally touch money. It's normal. Uh, it's normalized to to touch, to use money. Most monks, maybe 95% of all the monks in the world, use money. So. Uh, so chances are you're going to encounter monks who use money. And although I say you shouldn't give money to monks, you should uh, do things in an, an allowable way and providing what the monks need. And there are ways to make wholesome donations, there are ways to make unwholesome donations. So there are three major rules, four major rules, uh, regarding uh, using money. The first one is the Raja Sikapada. So this is the uh, training rule on kings. We'll, we'll talk extensively in that because this is one of the ways that we can get things that we need. There is the Rupiya Sikapada. And this is the training rule on, on money. Again, this is also very important. We have the Rupiya Samohara Sika Padam. This is the training rule on exchanging, uh, exchanging currency, currency exchange. And uh, the, there's another, uh, the Kai Wike Sika Padam. And this is the training rule on trading, bartering and trading. And so the, the main rule that we have is the Nisagya Pachitya is uh, number 18. The rupiah sika padang. It's the rule on money. Basically, the monk cannot accept money. He cannot have it accepted for him. And this is, uh, if he does, it has to be forfeited. Nisagya means uh, it has to be uh, forfeited. Vachitya means that it has to be confessed. He has to forfeit the property, and he has to confess that he did that. And when he confesses, he has to say, <laughs> he has to say what he did wrong, and he has to say that he promises never to do it again. If he doesn't do this, then his uh, confession, or his way of purifying himself is not complete. So he must make the determination not to do this again, and he must uh, forfeit the property. It's, very, uh, it's a very basic rule, even though we could say it's mixed in with all the mass of rules. It's a basic rule that defines a monk who a monk is. We have, we have five precepts of a layperson. We have eight precepts of a serious yogi. And we also have ten precepts of a novice monk. And so the serious yogi also has five precepts. And the, the novice monk also has the eight precepts. Actually, one of the precepts is actually broken up into two parts. So the, the serious yogi actually has nine of the ten precepts as a novice monk. And what is that different precept that separates the serious yogi from a novice monk? That is the rule of using money. You should not use money. The first rule is not to, the monk is not allowed to kill or harm living beings. The monk is not allowed to steal. The monk is not allowed to engage in sexual activity, complete celibacy, which is different from the five precepts, the third precept of the five precepts. The monk is not allowed to lie. And the monk is not allowed to take any intoxicants. These are five of the ten precepts. The monk is not allowed to eat after high noon. The monk is not allowed to engage or watch singing, dancing, playing music, attending entertainment, 
programs, etc., any type of performance. And the monk is not allowed to wear perfumes, cosmetics, or decorations, or jewelry. Actually, the Theravada monks, you don't see them wearing any watches. Because most, most the monks, they interpret that uh, this is a way of decoration. These days, we use our telephone to, to know the time. Some monks don't have telephone, they have watches. I had a watch a long, long time ago. <laughs> I still have a watch, actually. But I, I either put it in my bag or I, or I put it in my belt to loop it around my belt. Most monks, they loop it around their belt. The monk is not allowed to sit or, or sleep on high and luxurious beds or chairs. And lastly, the monk is not allowed to accept money. This is the tenth precept, and this is what separates the monks, the monks' precepts from the serious lay yogi precepts. The eighteenth rule of Nisagya Pechitya forbids monks from accepting money, gifts of money, or from getting others to accept them. Consenting of gifts of money meant for him to be placed down next to him. And money is considered anything used in business or trade. Some people think that checks, you know, that personal checks, I don't think we use those anymore so much, but uh, that personal checks don't count as money, it's just paper. Actually, if you look at the dollar bill, the U.S. dollar bill, it says bank note on it, bank note. It's a note from the bank. <laughs> so, but this is liquid. This is used in business or trade. So money, anything that a, that a store would accept that's not from their own um, company, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, uh, that's used in business or trade and at any store, like, then uh, we would say that this is money. These days, Target and Amazon gift cards, uh, we, we could say they can be a little controversial because they themselves are becoming like money. We'll talk about that later. The, uh, the 19th and 20th rule, uh, forget, forbid the monk from engaging in buying, selling, or bartering, regardless of whether it involves money and, of course, a currency exchange. And so the monk has to be careful, even if he's working with a kapya, about uh, changing money, exchanging money, or uh, ordering to trade certain things. He has to be careful in his speech. It has to be very passive so that the, the, the helper uh, uh, understands on their own free will what to do. So the, the monk has to be very, very careful about what he says. If he says the wrong things, then... Again, these requisites can be made unallowable or the items bought with that. However, there is an allowance called the Mendica allowance, and this is what we use. It's, in, um, it's part of the, 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 rule on, uh, the rule of kings, the Rajasika Pada. And this allows, um, allows a monk to get things what he needs to allow him to get what he needs when he needs it. And the Buddha says, this is from the Buddhist monastic code, it's a translation, there are people of conviction and confidence, bhikkhus, who place gold in the hands of stewards, these are what we call kapyas or helpers, with this, give the master what is allowable. I allow you, bhikkhus, to accept what is allowable coming from that. But, in no way at all do I say that gold or silver is to be accepted or sought for. So these, uh, this, these words is the mendica allowance. And the monks normally use this allowance to get what they need. And we'll be talking about this. And this is uh, how... 
uh, monks get what they need. It's like a mystery. You don't touch money. How do you get around? How do you get, uh, how do you get airplane tickets to fly back home to visit your parents? How do, you get, uh, um, how do you get this? How do you get that? So uh, normally, actually, I just use uh, donors of mine directly. Um, but uh, we'll talk about uh, everything. So the, the Buddhist monastic code even says, it says, even given this allowance, though, the, though it is important that the bhikkhu, in his dealings with the s steward, the kapya, does not say or do anything that would transgress uh, the other rules. I spoke about that before. At the same time, it is important that he does not abuse the kapya, the helper, from his services. He shouldn't be demanding, and he shouldn't, uh, he shouldn't order like, uh, in a demanding way. He should be very patient, very patient to the, the helper, and uh, understand that this helper has a whole other life to him. And so we have, um, we have limitations on how, how much we're allowed to ask the helper. If we go beyond that, then it's not uh, allowed. So there was a, there was a story, I'll, I, I won't read it to you, but uh, I'll, I'll summarize it to you. So there was, there was a, a, a helper who had, who had money for, for a robe, and uh, the monk went to that helper and he says, you know, give me the robe, I need a robe. And, uh, he says, uh, I, I will get it for you, but uh, I have an important meeting. And uh, in this meeting, uh, is late gets fined, let's say $50 or something like that. And uh, the monk insisted, he says, no, 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 I need that robe right now. And so the layperson helper was afraid to say no again to the monk. And uh, he, because of that, he was late to the meeting and they fined him $50. And so then, um, then uh, what happened was they asked him why he was late, and and uh, he explained the whole story. And then they they um, and everyone spread it about that this monk was very arrogant, and it's not uh, it's not becoming of the monk. It's not how the monk should act, and it's very important uh, not to not to act in this way. And because of that, there was a rule made. And so it's, it's very important to, uh, to be patient with the helpers. And so the, the Buddha, and this is in the Raja Sikavadam, the, the Buddha said that we're allowed to ask directly three times and we're allowed to ask indirectly six times for things that we need. This is mostly like uh, robes, uh, but it is extended as part of the great standards to do anything. And so we're allowed uh, indirect prompts, and uh, an indirect prompt is, it counts as half, half of a direct prompt. So basically, uh, we are allowed six direct prompts. So we're allowed to ask for something six times. So this can also be a problem because if we are, um, if we, if we are given, let's say, a large uh, amount of allowable requisites, if we're given a large amount of allowable requisites, and uh, and we're only allowed to ask six times, so we ask one time for a toothbrush, we allow, ask one time for, uh, you know, a notebook, <laughs> you know, and and let's say there's you know a few hundred dollars, yeah. And so we're only, allowed, uh, we're only allowed six times. After that, we can't ask for anything. So there are ways to, to get around that. But even so, even if we are allowed uh, an unlimited amount, we always have to be mindful of the, of the helper and his life and that he is a volunteer and that volunteers can leave and volunteers can get angry. <laughs> so have to be very careful. So we have what we call a copy invitation, and we have what we call a donor invitation. So 
a Kapia invitation. Kapia is, is the helper, is the volunteer. He's the steward. He's the person who takes care of the monk. And uh, the Kapia receives, let's say, Kapia talks with the, with the donor, and uh, the donor uh, gives the money to the Kapia, and then uh, the Kapia informs the monk. He informs the monk, and he says, you know, Venerable Sir, such and such person, uh, uh, has uh, left allowable requisites and the value of, let's say, $50 or something, $100. And, uh, and if you need anything, please let me know. That's what we call a uh, kapia invitation. The other type of invitation is the donor invitation. The donor invitation is when the donor directly invites and says, I have left $50, $100, whatever. Uh, there's no limit to how, how big or there's no uh, minimum as well. So just using as an example, $50, $100. I've left a 50 um, or $100 in allowable requisites or allowable requisites having the value with uh, such and such kapia, your helper. If you need anything, please ask that, that helper. And so... This is a donor invitation. So a kapia invitation is when the kapia is invited, the helper is inviting the monk. This would have a limit of six times. Donor or direct invitation from the donor doesn't have that limitation. So it's very important to know that. If you're the kapia, you will need, and you're doing a kapia invitation, you need to invite the monk again and again and again. Because if he runs out of those six times, if you... If you invite him again, he gets another six. If you invite him again, he gets another six. Um, some monks, they're always receiving uh, invitations. So they never run out of invitations. So that's, uh, some people <laughs> are always with the lay people. But to some people, they, they rarely receive requisites. And so uh, they, have to be, they have to be very careful of, of how many times they ask for something. But whether it's a six-time limitation or whether it's the donor invitation which is unlimited, one has to be very careful. One has to be very careful and patient to the helper's personal needs. His, his, he has a personality. He is a person. He is a worker. He's a volunteer. And he can leave at any time. And he can, get, he can lose faith. And we need to protect the faith of the helper. We also have to protect the faith of the donor as well. We have to make sure that the donor, um, we don't go beyond the means of the donor. And we might, uh, we have to make sure that the donor is still faithful, still active. If we feel that the donor has, this is a different type of invitation, I'll talk about that later, but we should always be mindful of the donor, the means and whatever as well, and the faith. So this is a requisite uh, form that I'm showing on the screen now. And what the donor does is the donor fills in the monk's name, he fills in his own name, and he fills in the amount of allowable requisites that he gave to the helper, the kapia, and then he gives, points out the name of the helper so that he can ask for anything he needs. So we're going to call the monk Tissa because we normally use Tissa uh, for, for general explanations. And we'll cop call the kapia Joe, and we'll call it $50. So it would say, uh, Venerable Tissa, sir, uh, I, the donor Joe, invite you to ask for anything you need, having the value of $50 from the kapia named Joe, or the appointed such and such monastery kapia. Whenever you need anything, please ask that kapia. So this is a standard form. And what's nice is the, the donor can, can give it to the monk. It's like giving a gift card almost. It's like a kapia gift card. <laughs> and so whenever he needs something, he can go to that, that helper and ask for anything need, he needs at any, any store, not just uh, you know, uh, one vendor or one company or another. Um, but it can, he, can, he can go to any place and get 
uh, requests what he needs, and then the, the, the helper ends up choosing the place that he wants to get something. So it's very important to use a form instead of saying something verbally, because you can make a mistake if you just say something off the top of your head. And so the donor can say the name of the monk, he can say the name of the kapiya, and he can say the amount of allowable requisites that were given to the kapiya, and then, in, and, uh, then the rest of the form uh, handles everything in terms of inviting. It becomes a donor invited, and uh, the donor can give the monk this form, it's like a, a gift card, and it works. What about store, store gift cards? So it's, it's possible, but you should invite the monk. It's important that the donor invites the monk with a, a, with a gift card, not just giving a gift card or something like that. It's, it's good to invite. It's better that way. And it should, it should, it's the same thing, except you, you name the store and the workers as uh, the kapiya. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll say it again. I show it on the screen here. It says, Venerable Tissa, sir, uh, I, um, uh, uh, the donor, blah, 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 invite you to ask for anything you need, having the value of, we'll say, $50 uh, USD from the store named, we'll call um, uh, Starbucks or something. And, uh, and or the appointed worker. Whenever you need anything, please ask that worker. So in this case, you're just replacing the uh, worker, uh, the kapia with the worker. And you're pointing out the store. And again, this is donor invited. And so after that, the, the monk can, can go to that uh, vendor, that store, and they can, they can uh, get what they need. It's not so good, though. I, I, we usually prefer not to, to do that. And even the requisites are, are I, I personally uh, think that the donors are, are, are better, but, um, but it's, it's, all, it's all useful. So you need to be careful. I said we talk about like Amazon gift cards or Target gift cards. So we have to be careful that some of these stores, you can, they're so big, uh, or they, they're comprised of many donors, like Walmart, online Walmart, or maybe Target does this too, or, or Amazon for sure has many uh, different vendors. It becomes almost like currency itself. And in fact, I've, I've, I've heard that um, these uh, scammers who, who do what we call phishing or something like that and scamming of of elderly uh, people or naive people. Uh, if they can't get the cash, uh, sometimes they even ask for uh, Target gift cards. I don't know why, uh, but they're asking for these. And they, they become uh, sort of um, like currency. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful. But uh, it's, it's controversial, and, uh, and some people would say that they're allowable. For sure, it's better than money. It's better, it's, it's definitely uh, better. If the intention is uh, correct and it's like an invitation, then uh, it, it might be allowable. I'm not going to make this decision. In general, it's best to have a, a kapia to, to get things for you because uh, then you're dependent on the, on the kapia. It's always good to have like a check and balance thing. If you have like your own gift card, you can just buy anything you want. There's a lot of stuff available on Amazon. <laughs> So a lot, of, a lot of stuff. You can buy alcohol on Amazon, I'm sure. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if you can buy a, uh, alcohol. But you can buy a lot of things uh, on Amazon. Um, I think it's, 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 it's unlimited what you, what you could buy. A monk, uh, you know, a monk can buy, you know, if he has a gift card um, and he starts just using that however he wants, then it might not be good. Even, even if you have maybe like uh, some other gift card and um, let's say Starbucks or something like that and you start, the monk can buy, um, can, can use the, see, he, he can use the, uh, the gift card to, to get uh, croissants or something like that in the afternoon. And that might not be good. So if we have a, if we have a copia that goes, uh, everything goes through properly, 
then the kapiya knows, no, this is not right for you to uh, get a croissant at, uh, at the wrong time. And so uh, the, the kapiya might say, you know, you're, you're doing this, you're doing that, it's wrong. And, uh, you know, sometimes the kapiya doesn't know like, how the monks need to be and they might make assumptions and be too strict. But a lot of times we have to listen to the kapiya. We have to. And we have to do without. And a lot of times it could be a very good reason that the kapiya is saying that. So we should always be mindful of the kapiya. The, the, the kapiya is a little bit of a check and balance. He's also the connector to the donor as well. And so it can be good for the monk. It can keep the monk in line. Too much freedom is not so good. So we have to be careful. Never ask a monk, how do I give money to you? Because <laughs> the monk must refuse it. It's, and then he can't, once you say that, he can't teach you anything. So you say, you say, um, you say, how, how can I make a donation to you? How do I make an allowable donation? Who is your helper? That's the key word. Who is your helper? And this is said in the, in the Raja Sikapada, the rule on the, on the king. Who is your helper? And so then uh, the monk can point out the helper. If they don't ask that, and then there, there can be a problem. So the... The kapiya should, should ask who the helper is. And then, uh, then everything can be handled. Usually the helpers are professional helpers. They know how to do this, and they've been trained by the monk. And if there is no helper, you can also volunteer to be a helper. You can, you can do this you can use uh, like a allowable requisites to a monk who uses money. You can use allowable requisites, especially for a monk who does not use money. You can use allowable requisites <laughs> to a child who should not use money, like a four-year-old. A lot of times we're like six years old. A lot of, a lot of the monks, um, we have to be, um, when it comes to money, yeah, we become a little bit like like a kid who has to ask his parents for things that we need. And it's, it's a very humbling thing a lot of times. It should be. It should be a humbling thing. I need this. <laughs> so there's a one story of a, of a monk, and he wanted to, his, uh, he wanted to um, get some shoes so he could walk back to his, uh, maybe his cave in, in the Himalayas. And the king loved this, this, uh, this monk, this ascetic, and he said, uh, uh, he wanted to go back, and he says, you know, he says, oh, uh, great king, I want to meet with you. And he has intention to ask for some slippers so he can go back. Uh, but he feels embarrassed, and he cancels the meeting. And every day <laughs> for, 12, <laughs> for 12 years, uh, he says, oh, great king, I want to meet with you. And, uh, and uh, the, um, the king comes down, yes, yes. And he says, ah, forget about it. And so uh, every day this happens. And then after 12 years, the king says, what, what, what is it? What do you need? He says, oh, I need some slippers. Slippers are like flip-flops. And uh, so he could walk back to his cave. <laughs> and so uh, then the king says, of course, you should have asked me. Of course, I would have helped you. And, uh, but this shows how the, um, how the monk should uh, feel about asking for things. And so we, we, we definitely should not be demanding about this. But if there's a problem, if there's a problem, then uh, the monk actually uh, should contact the donor. He should contact the donor, and it's actually his duty. He should contact the do donor and say, you know, I've, I've used up all my chances, or I've asked enough times. You know, whether it's uh, unlimited or not lim limited, uh, whether it's limited or unlimited amounts of times that he can ask, donor invited, or copy invited, uh, he still might not get what he needs or he needs to ask too many times. He should, he should contact the, the donor and he should say, you know, look, I've, I've, I'm not able to ask for these, uh, these items and I think your, your donation is going to waste. So when you give to a monk, let's say he uses money, you should 
give in an allowable way. But one time, one time, I have a, I have a dictionary project. I, I have a big project where, where we, we have a, some software to help people read the Pali texts, the ancient uh, Buddhist texts, the Pali texts. And we have a, a dictionary that has 200,000 words. And we need, needed some translators uh, who, were, who were Burmese, who could read the Burmese uh, dictionary and then translate it. But we also needed some experts as well who uh, knew Pali very well. And uh, one time we hired a monk who, who was uh, a PhD. And uh, we were looking for volunteers, but we also said we were looking to hire people, especially early on. We don't really do this much anymore. But uh, uh, this, uh, this monk contacted me, and he's, he, he's beating around, he's talking around it and stuff like that. And he basically said that, you know, if he doesn't get uh, five or six hundred dollars a month, uh, he wouldn't work. And uh, he called it appreciation. You know, he mentioned uh, another job that he had, and he was doing some translation or whatever research work, and he had uh, that amount of money. In, in bot, and I forget what it was. I think it was like five or six hundred dollars a month for so many hours. I think maybe twenty-five hours of work per month or something like that. And uh, and I told him, I said, look, you know, we're we're going to have to do this in an allowable way. What you do after that is your business, but we, on our end, we're going to do this in an allowable way. And so I asked him. I said, who is your helper? We need a helper. Otherwise, we can't do this. And, um, and so he gave us the name of a helper. And then I told the, the donor, one, one person who's funding this project, uh, uh, about, uh, about what, was, uh, what was needed. And, uh, and so we did uh, everything uh, in, in an allowable way. And, and then probably what happened was he either asked uh, his helper uh, for things that he needed, which would be really good, or he just told the helper to give him the money, which probably is what happened. Uh, but anyways, uh, uh, when, you, when you're dealing with monks who use money, then you should uh, do things always in an allowable way. Why? Why is it so bad for monks to use money? In the Upakalesa Sutta, in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Book of Fours, Rohitasa uh, Waga, the Sutta number 10. The Buddha says, stained by lust, anger, and blinded by ignorance, some monks and Brahmins take delight in sense pleasures. Those foolish monks and Brahmins drink alcohol, engage in sexual intercourse, accept gold and silver and money, and obtain their requisites by wrong livelihood. All of these are called corruptions by the Buddha who shines like the sun. These foolish monks and Brahmins who are corrupted by these corruptions, impure and defiled, do not blaze or shine, but instead bewildered, blinded, slaves to desire and full of craving. They increase the size of cemeteries by taking birth again and again. It's the book of force. So that means there's four items. The Buddha calls these people fools. Not me. The Buddha calls these monks fools. Drinking alcohol, one. Sexual intercourse, two. Gold, money, and silver. This is number three. Engaging in wrong livelihood. This is four. So these are very bad for the, the monk. And they're coupled uh, together. They're coupled together. Sexual intercourse is, is terrible. The monk is not longer a monk, no longer a monk if he engages in that. The other, the other offenses uh, do not uh, automatically disrobe the monk. But it should be noted that it's, it's coupled together with that. And so it's, the Buddha spoke very strongly about that. He says that the monk don't, no longer sh shines, and they increase the size of cemeteries by taking birth again and again and again. 
So basically he's saying you cannot become enlightened. A monk who makes uh, offenses for himself, it is a, a hindrance for him to attain enlightenment. But we say this in the very beginning of the Patimoka. Before we start, we say this. We say that uh, if you, even by remaining silent when, when asked if you have an offense, that this will be an antaraiko, this will be sampajana musavada. So this will be a problem for your, your progress on the path. This is what the Buddha said. We have to be careful. The Dhammapada says, this is a translation, even a wicked person, an evil person, sees goodness as long as their evil has not ripened. When their evil ripens, then the evil person sees only evil things. He sees only bad things. What does this mean? So when, when a person is using money, okay, he gets a very, um, he gets very pleasurable things. He can get whatever he wants. It's very nice. But later, uh, this will come back to him because it's, it's bad for him to do and it's bad karma. And when we have bad karma, kamma, then uh, those kamas have effects. And so it's, it's, it's not good at all. The, the opposite happens. You know, so we have good people, virtuous people who seize uh, evil things. They have bad things come to them as long as their goodness has not ripened. But when their good, goodness ripens, then those virtuous people see only good things. So this is the Dhammapada, 119 and 120. And so it's, a, it's very important. So sometimes there's, uh, not sometimes, a lot of times when, or almost all the time, uh, actually, when you do good things or bad things, it will affect you in your next life, actually. Except under very special con conditions, um, it can affect you in, in, in this life, but it's, it's usually very weak, as, as we, we say. There are like seven javanas. We have a whole Abhidhamma about this, and the first javana, which is very weak, will affect you in this life. So this is in the Dhammapada, 119, 120. Then uh, in the next verse as well, the next two verses, do, do not underestimate the effects of evil, thinking it will not come to fruition. Just as a water pot is filled by falling drops, so too, so too the fool, the, the fool fills himself with evil little by little. What does this mean? This means that when you do little things, you know, it adds up. And you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful, especially with money. A, monk's, a monk who's using money has to be very careful because every time he uses that item, every time he uses that item, he is making bad karma for himself. He is making apati for himself, we say, an offense. And so this is, a, this is very bad. It's not like, you know, let's suppose you, you do something uh, wrong. Um, one time, I don't know, let's say you, um, you're eating food and you, you don't want to stop eating, okay? And it's, it's after afternoon. So you're late, you say, what do I do? I need to eat or something like that. You shouldn't do this. <laughs> but you're, you're late and you're eating and you want to continue eating. So what happens? Every, every time you chew the food, okay, this is what we call a, an act of wrongdoing, a dukkha apati. And when, you're, when you swallow, this is a pachitya offense. For every swallow, it's an offense. You finish your meal, it's finished. Okay, there's no more offenses that happen. You confess, it's finished. But with nisagya pachitya, with using money, using objects bought with money, every time you use it, even though it was 10 years ago, you're collecting those drops of bad karma. 
So as you can see, that little drops, they can add up, just like the pot is filled with the drops. <clears throat> you might have a leaky uh, water tap, water faucet. And, and to save the water so you don't, you get to use it later on. You might put a bucket or a pot or something, a bowl or whatever. And, you know, at nighttime you, you, you put that, that bucket underneath it and it drips, 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 drips. And then in the morning it's full. So you have to be careful. The opposite. Do not underestimate the effects of a virtue, thinking that it will not come to fruition. Just like a water pot is full, uh, by the, it's filled by the falling drops, so too does the wise person uh, fills himself with the virtue little by little. So you want to give what is allowable. You don't want to give what is not allowable. It is difficult to say It is difficult to say that there is no merit in giving unallowable money. But we can definitely say it's, it's, not, it's not good for the monk. It's definitely not good for the monk. Can we say that... Um, can, can we say that uh, the uh, giving alcohol to a child is making merit? Can we say that? The donation has fruit if it is obtained by, if the thing that you're donating is obtained by right livelihood. The receiver is pure, the donor is pure, and the gift, the power also is based on uh, the gift that is given, the actual value of it, how useful it is, etc., how much it meant to you, how much money you make, and how much of a percentage of that is, is yours, etc. So, uh, if you're giving something that is unallowable to the monk, then this is not good for his purity. And that will affect the, the results of your donation. So, just like you wouldn't want to give alcohol to a child, it's very difficult to say that there's making merit then we also should not give money to a monk. You should not give money to a four-year-old child. <laughs> because, you know, the parents might not like it. You give $100 to a four-year-old kid and don't tell the parents, the parents will get angry at you probably. What are you doing doing that to my child? In the same way, you don't want to do that to, to, to a monk. And a lot of times, a lot, in other ways, we are also like six-year-old children. And the Buddha knew that, and that's why he, he gave us uh, these rules, and so we have to protect ourselves. So the Sarata Deepani uh, says this, uh, that bad things can come to you if you, if you die with offenses. A monk, a monk dies with offenses. And Pa Aksadoji, he always, he always talks about this phrase, and uh, many Vinaya monks talk about this phrase. Sapatika sabikwe nirayamwa vadami tirachana yonimwa ti. So, what does that mean? It means that the monk who dies with an offense will go to the hell or the animal realm, or we could say the ghost realm. And so, if, you, if he has all these things that he's attached to, he can, he can give up everything before he dies. And I think a lot of monks do that. But if they're attached to it until their, their death, then uh, this can be uh, a problem. And they don't confess and they don't purify themselves. But even if they do, they're still collecting all of this karma again and again and again and again and again, just like the drop of water fills the pot. It's still there. So have to be careful. So you don't want to give things that are harmful to the monk and harmful for his future. Most of the things that when you do something wrong, it comes back to you in the next and future lives. You want to help him, right? You don't want to hurt him. You don't want to give alcohol to a monk. You don't want to give alcohol to a, a six-year-old. You don't want to give $100 to a six-year-old. So this system encourages monks to know that it is possible 
to live without money. If you have allowable requisites, whether the monk uh, uses money or he doesn't use money, follows the vinya, this system of allowable requisites encourages monks to not use money, to understand that it's possible to live without money. And so it's, a, it's a very important that even if the monk uses money, this can be um, a good influence for the monk. He knows that you know that the monk shouldn't use money. And so this can cause a little bit of shame, wholesome shame. And there was one monk, actually. A long time ago, I had this donor. I don't know if I, I really have him anymore, but at one time, I asked him, I said, can I make challenges for monks, you know, where they relinquish everything and I will, they just throw it away, whatever, and I will replace everything they have, even the laptop, even all their books. Maybe a few thousand dollars. Monks are not that very rich, most monks. And I, I, I there was one monk I met and he, he seemed like a really good monk. And, and I told him, I said, give up all your stuff and I'll replace it. And he, he agreed that after he finishes his uh, master's or PhD, I think it was, after he finishes, he'll, he will renounce everything. And uh, I can't remember how long, how long it took, but I think five or six years or something later, uh, another monk came to me and says, do you know that monk? Uh, you made him feel so shameful in a wholesome way. And uh, he remembered it. And he gave up everything, and, and uh, I think his parents are, are wealthy anyways. And he has his own monastery. And now there's like 70 or 80 uh, people at the monastery. And uh, I almost went there. Instead, I went to um, the International Institute of Theravada. But I, I mean, literally like a week before I was going to leave, uh, he called me up, and he, he told me about how happy he was. And he the monastery, and he showed me the place uh, by video. And uh, he invited me to, to, to stay at his monastery, an allowable monastery. And so, um, so when you do this, uh, it, can, it can change someone's life. And uh, not only that, he started his own monastery. It's a proper monastery. It's a, a monastery that follows the proper vinya. And so it's very good. What is better than uh, allowable requisites? We talked about the forms. Is when you give just an open invitation to the monk. No limit of money. Uh, there's no limit of allowable requisites, the value, and there's no limit in time. By doing that, you can say, the donor says, by doing that, the donor says, if there is anything you ever need, please let me know. Ever, if there's, if you ever need anything, this is in time, it's called the Nitya Purana. It's a forever invitation. And if there's anything, it's open, uh, please let me know. You can also say food or you can say whatever. Uh, please let me know. So this is uh, one type of donation. And what happens is the donor, uh, the donor just buys things himself and gives it to the, to the monk. And this is, this is good because the, the donor is knowing what is being done with his donation. When they do allowable requisites, they don't know what is being done. It's just a gift certificate, a copy of a gift certificate, and then this is finished. Uh, the donation is made, and the donor walks away. But it, it can be good, because sometimes the, the donor can get too attached to what they're donating. If there is anything you ever need within my means, please let me know. It's always within your need, means, but it's good to remind the, the monk <laughs> that he doesn't go beyond the means. So he knows like what your job is, or he knows how much uh, uh, expendable uh, income you have, et cetera, et cetera. And he doesn't go beyond it. So there are, there are some uh, very powerful donors. Um, sometimes they can ask for a new roof or something like that. And the donor is very capable of doing that. Um, sometimes a person might work in a coffee shop and might only be able to offer coffee or something. So the monk has to know them within the means. There's another one. Uh, one time this happened to me. Uh, if there's anything you ever need, even beyond my means, 
please let me know. And he knew a lot of people. He said he knew a lot of people and he could organize things. And so <laughs> we, almost, uh, we almost made a monastery uh, when that happened. Uh, and later he, he said that it was his dream to make a monastery and he was, he was trying to organize things. We were looking for land, etc. cetera. Uh, but that didn't happen. So the monk can ask for anything he needs while the donor is still faithful. Okay, the donor has to be connected. Um, if you feel that you're disconnected, if, you, if you're a layperson, you've made a donation offer uh, to the monk and you feel you're disconnected or something like that, you should contact the monk and you should say, you should renew your invitation. It's very important to do that because the monk might stop asking you for things. And so uh, you should... Uh, you should renew that invitation. That's why we have allowable requisites because sometimes uh, when you give something, you know, it's, it's given. And uh, so that's, that can be a, a good reason for that as well. But it's good to uh, renew your invitations. If you're the kapiya, you should renew your invitation all the time. Every time the monk asks for something, every time he, you bring something to him, you should re-invite him again if you're the kapiya. And if you're the donor, you should also re-invite the, uh, the monk as well so that he doesn't forget that you're still faithful, that you're still interested in, in uh, giving. And it, it's good because it brings contact with the monk um, and uh, it's, so it's good for both, both, both the monk and the donor. And you also know directly what is being given. You are the giver, you are making the effort to give it. You know, many times you might be giving with your own hands. Uh, it's, it's good merit in this way. Whatever the case is, when you give, focus on cause and effect. Focus on the purity of the receiver. Focus on the purity of yourself. Focus on, on the item that's being given, how, how you got the item and its causes and effects. Share merit with the, the departed relatives and all beings and make a wish for it to support you in your practice and reaching the Nibbana Supreme. It's very important to, to use this as a vehicle to escape samsara. So we talked about that you should not give money to monks. This is very clear. We talked about allowable requisites and gift cards we talked about the rules regarding money. We talked about why it is bad for the monk to use money. We talked about allowable requisites and kapiya gift cards. Or we can say it's like a kapiya gift card. We talked about how they work and all about the, how many times you can ask, how to treat the, the kapiya and the, the helper, kapiya means helper, and uh, to be patient and not to um, be demanding. We also talked about why it's important to give uh, direct invitations and, and be the person who obtains the items for the monk that he needs. These are direct invitations, like if you ever need anything, please let me know, etc. And we also talked about how you should give and what you should focus on and how you should dedicate your merits for yourself and others and the departed relatives. And so, whether or not you're one who gives to the, to the monks or whatever, if you've watched to the very end of this, you have made good merit. You have learned about the monk's rules. You have learned about uh, um, the monk's way of life, what is good for the monk, how to make merit, how to make good donations, etc. So even by watching this video, you are able to uh, make good merit even now. And so may you uh, take this knowledge that you have gained from this uh, fairly long Dhamma talk on the Vinaya, on the monk's rules, may you use this, this knowledge as a way to make merit and also to help other monks on the path, whether they follow uh, the rules of using money or whether, they follow, or whether they don't follow these rules, to help all monks. You should help all monks. And to help the monk so that he can feel secure 
and also to encourage the monk to follow the rules. This is most important, to support and encourage to follow the rules and encourage uh, the, the path to Nibbana. By helping someone get to Nibbana, you're also helping yourself get to Nibbana in the future because cause and effect, of course. So may you use uh, this knowledge and put it into action so that you yourself can reach Nibbana safely and quickly. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.